Aloha. Thank you guys uh, for holding in there for us. Um, welcome to the Hawaii Department of Transportation 2023 Protect Our Water Conference. My name is Logan Hicks. I'll be your in-person moderator for this uh, session. Uh, the session titled um, Proposed Renewal of HAR 1155 Appendix C. Um, at the end of the uh, presentation, uh, the speaker will have a few minutes to answer your question. Uh, if any virtual attendees have questions, uh, please use the Q&A section during the presentation to ask any questions you may have. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to present to you our speaker for this session. His name is Robert Fan. He has been an environmental engineer at the Department of Health Clean Water Branch since 2019. He implements the NPDES permitting program through the evaluation of design plans and technical reports. The calculation of effluent limitations and the issuance of NPDES permits providing coverage to engineering product projects. He researches and evaluates the design requirements of erosion and sediment controls, as well as water quality criteria of toxic pollutants. Uh, he also proposes amendments and finalizes rules for water pollution control and water quality standards to help protect our state waters. Uh, please help me in introducing and welcoming uh, Robert Fan. Good morning, Robert. Morning, everybody. Aloha. I'm sorry, but um, I have to glance this way because there's nothing on the laptop. So I just want to make sure that everything is uh, showing correctly. Uh, so aloha, everybody. I'm Robert Fan. I'm an environmental engineer with the Department of Health, Clean Water Branch. Uh, the mission of the Clean Water Branch is twofold. Uh, the first one is to protect the health of everybody, of everyone that who recreates um, in and on uh, our coastal and marine waters. And the second um, is to protect and restore our coastal and marine uh, waters uh, for animal, um, for marine life and wildlife. Uh, these goals are achieved uh, through permit issuance, monitoring, enforcement, um, polluted runoff control, and of course, public outreach. So mahalo for uh, allowing me this um, a chance to participate in the uh, HDOT 2023 uh, Protect the Water Conference. This is the outline of uh, today's presentation. I guess we'll just stand this way. Uh, first, I'll briefly uh, describe the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, permit program. Um, then I'll go over the proposed uh, revisions to the general permit that provides um, coverage for the runoff from construction activities. Um, then I'll talk about the process of renewing um, that coverage. And last, we'll have a Q&A session. The Hawaii State Department of Health is authorized by the EPA to administer the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or again, NPDES uh, permit program. The uh, permit program regulates point source discharges of pollutants to state waters. The permits are drafted to ensure that the discharges do not exceed or meet concentration levels of water quality standards that are specified in uh, HAR 1154. The permits are drafted in accordance with uh, HAR 1155. To better understand the NPDES permit program, um, I like to um, define a couple words. So. The key terms that we have is point source, discharge, and state waters. So point source is a uh, identifiable uh, conveyance, um, such as a pipe, a ditch, a channel, um, a well from which pollutants can be discharged. Channelized runoff is considered and treated as a point source. So channelized runoff from construction sites, especially large construction sites, can deposit substantial amounts of sediments and other pollutants into state waters. 
point sources include indirect discharges that do not directly discharge to a state waters, but the discharge pollutant eventually uh, reach the state waters. Um, we're all aware of the uh, U.S. Supreme Court ruling about the uh, indirect underground discharge from the Lahaina Wastewater Treatment Facility, which is considered as a functional equivalent of a point source discharge. Discharge or the discharge of pollutants is the addition of a pollutant or a combination of pollutants into state waters. Discharges include discharges from pipes, sewers, and discharges from runoff that is channelized. Pollutants can be classified as conventional pollutants, toxic pollutants, and non-conventional pollutants. Uh, conventional pollutants include fecal bacteria, uh, total suspended solids, pH, oil, and grease. Uh, toxic pollutants include priority pollutants, so for example, um, heavy metals such as lead, organic chemicals such as benzene. And the last uh, category is non-conventional pollutants, and these can include emerging um, pollutants such as PFOS, uh, nutrient pollutants, um, such as the total nitrogen, a TN, and anything else. The list of pollutants is developed and updated by the EPA. Uh, state waters are defined in HR 1155 called water quality standards. State waters are all waters, fresh, brackish, marine waters within and up to three nautical miles around the state. State waters include streams, ditches, channels, lakes, embayments, uh, wetlands, and so on. Most of all, state waters and waters of the US or WOTUS are jurisdictionally different. State waters include groundwater, WOTUS does not. State waters include all wetlands and WOTUS only includes adjacent wetlands or wetlands that are connected to navigable waters. I hope that this brief um, introduction or definition of the key terms such as point sources, discharges, and state waters will help you have a better understanding of the scope of the NPDES permit program. NPDES permit coverage can be either an individual coverage or a general coverage. Uh, permit coverage always lasts five years, have terms lasting five years. For an individual, uh, permit coverage, a facility initiates the permitting process by submitting a individual permit application. Pending the review of the application, the drafting of an individual permit, and the public notice of the drafted permit, uh, the permit coverage is provided through the issuance of an individual permit. Um, the individual permit would have permit conditions, effluent limitations that the facility must comply with for the discharge of point sources to state waters. Uh, usually a individual permit is a thick document averaging more than 50 pages usually. Contrary to an individual permit coverage, the general permit coverage is applicable to a group of facilities that are similar. Essentially, the facilities can comply with the requirements of the general permit. And so the permitting process is actually started by submitting um, a notice of intent or an NOI to request permit coverage. The review of the NOI will eventually lead to the issuance of a general permit coverage uh, through the issuance of a notice of general permit coverage, so NGPC, and NGPCs are usually very short, and they're less than five pages in length compared to the 50 pages or more of an individual permit. There's a total of 12 general permits that are specified in append 
from Appendix B to Appendix M of HR 1155. The general permit that covers discharges from construction activities is uh, specified in Appendix C. And this appendix will expire on February 8th of next year, 2024. Um, I highlighted um, the ones that might be of interest to um, the audience, and that's the um, general permit that covers dewatering activities. Any questions about, you can ask me, yeah, so. Um, for the rest of this presentation, I'll refer to the Appendix C general permit as the CGP, and I'll be using the term as current CGP to mean the current version of the Appendix C, and proposed CGP would be the proposed version of Appendix C that is right now um, at the governor's office requesting his approval. The following, um, I'll also use the following color convention uh, on the slides about the proposed CGP. All proposed major revisions to the current CGP are shown in bold red text. So if you're on a slide and there's no bold red text, it just means that there's no proposed major revisions to that section of the current CGP. Okay. So here's the list of the proposed major revisions to the current CGP. Uh, the first is to add permit coverage for stormwater discharges from snowmelt runoff. Linking, the second will be linking pollution prevention controls and the volume of pollutants that are present at the construction site. Maintaining the uniformity of the requirements for water quality standards and requiring that discharges do not lower the water quality of state waters. The fourth one would be streamlining the documentation of corrective actions through the use of a corrective action log. And lastly is to clarify the renewal process of NGPCs under the CGP. The proposed CGP provides coverage for the discharge of stormwater runoff associated with construction activities and construction support activities that result in the disturbance of more of one acre or more of total land area. The proposed CGP has, I'm sorry, a term of five years starting from the approval date. And I'll talk more about the approval date in the third part of my presentation. The trigger for submitting an NOI to request permit coverage under Appendix C is the total disturbance area being one acre or more in size. The total disturbance area includes construction areas and construction support areas. So is permit coverage necessary if the construction area is less than one acre? The answer is no. The proposed CGP adds general permit coverage for stormwater discharges from snowmelt runoff. Snowmelt runoffs are included in the current EPA construction general permit, which is what we call the 2022 EPA CGP. And the proposed um, requirements that we have uh, are as stringent as the one that are uh, right now specified in the EPA uh, CGP. Currently, I can only think of one potential project where there are uh, snowmelt runoff in Hawaii. Anybody want to have a guess? Yeah, Mauna Kea, the 30 meter telescope project. And that's the only one I can think of. It's too cold for me up there, by the way, so. The proposed I'm sorry, I, I wish I could see better, but anyway. I have to put my glasses on to see this. I, I can't see with my glasses on. Just... 
Okay. Anyway, uh, the proposed CGP does not cover, co does not provide coverage, I'm sorry, for the following types of snow water discharge, storm water discharges, discharges into fresh water lakes, saline lakes, NKLine pools, discharge into sanitary sewer systems, discharges containing treatment chemicals from construction activities, discharges containing groundwater or accumulated water from the watering activities. Um, permit coverage under an Appendix G is required for the watering activities. And discharge that are regulated by existing individual permits or regulated under Section 404 permits for dredge and fill activities. Uh, Section 404 permits are issued um, by the Corps of Engineers. The proposed CGP has standard conditions that are specified in Appendix A of HAR 1155. Standard conditions are the boilerplate um, requirements that are specified in all NPDES permits. Uh, an example of a standard condition would be um, the requirements for reporting non-compliance events, uh, the requirements for terminating an existing uh, permit. The main section of all NPDES permit is the effluent limitations. Effluent limitations are technology-based requirements. Uh, we'll call them uh, T-bells, so technology-based effluent limitations, or they can be water quality-based requirements, or we call them Q-bells, so water quality-based effluent limitations. The proposed CGP specifies the following three effluent limitations for all authorized discharges from the construction site. So the first one is the insulation of stormwater controls. Stormwater controls include erosion controls, sediment controls, perimeter controls, uh, pollution prevention controls. Stormwater controls must account for soil porosity. They must account for drainage features and also the most, take into account the most recent weather patterns. The proposed CGP stresses the importance of using or considering recent rainfall data so that earth disturbing activities can be planned during periods where there's a lower risk of rainfall. The proposed CGP reinforces the linkage between the types of pollution prevention measures and the volumes of pollutants that are present at the construction site. The proposed CGP specifies 55 gallons as the volume threshold for determining if the amount of chemical is small or large at the construction site. The proposed 55 uh, gallon volume threshold is the size of the common barrels um, and it is the same as the threshold used by the EPA in the 2022 EPA CGP. When smaller amounts of chemicals are present at the website, the, at the website, at the construction site, I'm sorry, the proposed CGP specifies control requirements that can be easily moved around the construction site. And when it's a large amount of um, chemicals, then the CGP proposes requirements that are more adapt for storing chemicals at a fixed location. Stormwater controls are inspected and maintained to ensure their effectiveness in preventing and reducing pollutant discharges. To avoid any confusion between routine man maintenance of a stormwater control and the repair of a defective stormwater control, the proposed CGP defines routine maintenance to be the repair or upkeep of a stormwater control, and it makes that different from the repair of a defective stormwater control. The second Effluent limitation is limitation of stabilization measures to minimize the amount of exposed soil during 
the construction activities. And the third and last effort limitation is the infiltration of discharges from stormwater controls into vegetated areas at the, con at the construction site, unless deemed inadvisable. The proposed CGP clarifies that infiltration should not be maximized unless when there are geological features that prevent this from taking place or when there are potential risks of contamination to groundwater. The proposed CGP requires the implementation of controls if necessary to ensure that, auth that authorized discharges into receiving state waters meet applicable water quality standards. The current CGP prohibits, and this is the current language, all discharges that have the reasonable potential of causing or contribute an excursion above any applicable water quality criteria. The proposed CGP removes all references to this potential excursion or potential exceedances of water quality criteria. The proposed CGP prohibits all discharges that lower the water quality of receiving state waters. So there's no more use of the uh, reasonable potential analysis that is usually carried out uh, for individual permits. The proposed CGP also requires the implementation of additional controls if necessary to ensure that authorized discharge into impaired waters also meet water quality standards. The stormwater pollution prevention plan or SWIP serves as, a, as the roadmap to ensure compliance with the effluent limitations and the permit conditions of the CGP. The SWIP must be in place before the start of construction activities. The proposed CGP requires the development and implementation of a SWIP for the construction site. There are both stormwater controls and there are administrative controls that are specified in the SWIP. Administrative controls include the procedures for inspection, maintenance, and corrective action, and the designation of the stormwater team. I wanna say a few words about uh, the training requirements for the stormwater team. The EPA added to the 2022 EPA CGP training requirements to ensure that personnel who are conducting inspections are competent and they have received the proper training um, for uh, their duties. The 2022 EPA CGP uh, requires that um, people carrying out, personnel carrying out inspection must complete either the EPA construction inspection course and pass the exam designed for that training course or hold equivalent um, uh, credits from a similar program. The Clean Water Branch considers the 2022 EPA CGP training requirements to be an extension of the current requirement that personnel conducting inspection is a qualified person. The proposed CGP does not have the adopted or incorporated the EPA 2022 um, training provisions. The proposed CGP also requires the modification of a SWIP to reflect changing conditions and the SWIP must be readily available at the construction site. Inspection requirements. The current CGP requires the schedule inspection of the construction site to prevent and detect violations of applicable water quality criteria. There are two sites inspection frequency. There's a weekly one and a bi-weekly one and within 24 hours of a major storm event. It is vital to conduct uh, inspections within a day of the occurrence of a storm event to identify water controls that have been compromised and are no longer functioning properly and to avoid any discharges of pollutants. The proposed CGP adds site inspection requirements for that are necessary to account for its runoff from snow melt. The proposed CGP has a threshold for triggering the need for inspection 
as three and a quarter inches or more of accumulated snow within a 24 hour period. For snow accumulation, a site inspection is only required if the snow melts from the accumulated snow. So as an example, uh, it's been snowing for two days. Um, there's more than three and a quarter inches of snow accumulated, but it's still below freezing. So there's no melting, there's no runoff. So until there's melting and a runoff, inspections are not required. All inspection reports must be readily available at the construction site. The proposed CGP does not require site inspection of areas that are deemed unsafe to inspection personnel and when the unsafe conditions have been documented. Corrective action requirements. The proposed CGP requires permittees to take corrective action to stop or prevent a violation of applicable water quality credit standards. Corrective actions include the repair, modification, replacement of stormwater control, and the cleanup and disposal of spills or other deposits. The proposed CGP also requires the documentation of each corrective action taken in a corrective action log. The proposed CGP streamlines the documentation required for a corrective action by replacing the current requirement for a corrective action report with new requirements for documenting the same information as an entry in a corrective action log. The corrective action log must be readily available at the construction site. So rather than filing separate reports, there will be a running log of all the corrective actions that are taken. Coverage under the CGP. On September 1 of this year, the Clean Water Branch submitted to the governor's office the proposed revision to HR 1155 for approval. The submitted rules package include the proposed revision to HR 1155 and the proposed um, renewal of three general permits. Those that are specified in Appendix C, Appendix J, and Appendix L. All three general permits will expire on February at midnight on February 8th of next year, 2024. The Clean Water Branch does not know when the submitted rule package will be signed by the governor. Um, there are quite a lot of uh, items on his agenda, on his plate right now. The CW, the Clean Water Branch estimates that the approval will happen before the end of December this year. Depending on the actual approval date, so this is going back to the approval date, the approval date of when the governor signs becomes the effective date of a general permit. And then from that approval date, that effective date, the term lasting five years starts. So that's where the approval date comes in. Depending, therefore, on the approval date, there are different actions for permittees who have effective NGPCs or owners who want to request for permit coverage under Appendix C. So there are two uh, scenarios possible. It's called the early scenario and the late scenario. Um, in, in the chart that's shown on this, um, uh, the, the red bar is the uh, expiration date of Appendix C. So that's February 8th of next year. Uh, we could have two scenarios. The governor will sign the approval date is before February 8th. And we'll call that the early scenario. And then we could have the late scenario, which is a date that happens after the 8th. So... Uh, again, so these, um, I'm going to give examples. These are only examples to um, illustrate the administrative extension process. Um, there's no action requires on the part of any permittee right now. It's just for information. So um, let's say um, for the early approval that the approval date, I'm sorry, will be December 1 of this year. So what happens? So in this early uh, scenario, on December 1 of this year, all effective NGPCs will be administratively and automatically extended for 60 days. So until January 29th of 2024. 
All permittees will be notified by email of the start date and of the end date of the extended general permit coverage. If a permittee needs to maintain extended general permit coverage under Appendix C beyond, in this example, January 29th of 2024, the permittee must review and evaluate the revised Appendix C and see if compliance is possible. If compliance is possible, then the permittee will submit a renewal NOI, and this must be done before January 29th of 2024. Permit coverage is maintained while the Clean Water Branch is processing and reviewing a submitted renewal NOI. So if you look at that chart, that's the green period, which is essentially from December and most of January, and that's the 60 days right there. Um, to be exact for 60 days, it, you know, if it starts on December 1, when the governor signs 60 days after, it's going to be January 29th. But for the sake of the chart, you know, it's essentially those two months right there. For an owner um, who wants to submit and request permit coverage under Appendix C, all that owner has to do is to just review the revised Appendix C, see if compliance is possible, and just submit a regular NOI to request permit coverage. In the other uh, scenario, which is the late scenario, and in this example, um, let's say, you know, a worse scenario, I would call it, we'll call it late, it's worse. Um, the rules package is signed on May 1 of next year. Okay. So what happens? So what will happen is that from February 9th, on February 9th of next year, all effective NGPCs will be automatically and administratively extended for an undefined period. So on February 9th of next year, in the late scenario, we don't know when the governor is going to sign. So all of them will be extended for an undefined period. On May 1, when the rules are approved, then we set all of the extension to end in 60 days. So they will end on June 29th of 2024 in this example. Okay, so all permittees will be notified of the start date. In this case, it will be February 9 of the extension. And once the approval date is known, another email will be sent to say that the extended main permit coverage will end on June 29th. So if a permittee wants to maintain extended coverage beyond June 29th of 2024 in this late scenario, the permittee would review the revised um, Appendix C and submit a renewal NOI before or by the 29th of June of 2024. While the Clean Water Branch is processing and reviewing the renewal NOI permit coverage is maintained. For owners who wants to, an owner who wants to submit for permit coverage from February 9th to April 30th, there's a slight hitch. There's no way of applying for an NOI because the general permit has expired on February 8th. So that's the, um, the worst scenario, as I said, as in this example. But from May 1 of 2024, in this late scenario, owners can review the revised Appendix C, see if compliance is possible, and submit an NOI to request permit coverage. Again, um, these are examples. We do not know when the actual approval date is. So um, there's no action required. It's just... Um, we would let every uh, permittee know about the status of the approval process. And um, the closer we get to it, or the closer we can be sure of when it will be signed, we'll let everybody know. Okay. So the, the Clean Water Branch uh, does not 
um, recommend doing nothing uh, while we're waiting for the approval of the rules package. Um, we are recommending the following actions. Uh, we recommend that um, the rules package should be um, evaluated and reviewed um, to see if compliance is possible. Um, usually for a rules package that has been submitted, there are no changes that we can make um, to that rule package because we have to go through the entire public notice period. So um, we cannot. So um, the rules package as submitted gives a good um, feel of what the next uh, Appendix C would be like. We recommend um, permittees to review the, I'm sorry, the um, F1 limitation requirements in section five, the inspection requirements in section nine, and the corrective action requirements in section 10 of the proposed CGP. So rather than waiting till we have the actual approved date, it's, it's a good thing. It's proactive uh, steps to take is to just review uh, what is being proposed. The second thing that we recommend is to make sure that the certifying person who will submit the NOI, the renewal NOI, can submit electronically at the e-permitting website. The certifying person must meet the signatory requirements of 115507A. Um, so as an example, um, I'm a staff engineer working for a consulting firm. I cannot be designated as the certifying person. For a corporation, the certifying person must be um, corporate officers, corporate managers. So though there are requirements on them. Um, the certifying person must be authorized to submit electronically. And if the person cannot, then that person should submit an electronic subscriber agreement so that we could you know, authorize that person to submit electronically at um, the e-permitting portal. So what had happened is in since February of this year, I should put it this, this way. Before February of this year, the, the submission of NOI tends, uh, was a two-track process. So what I would call the technical information is usually submitted by consultant, by engineers. And then there's another component, which is the legal component, the liability component, which is usually a hard copy signature of the owner saying, I certify whatever was submitted. So it was always a two-track process. What happened is since February of actually since January 31 of this year, uh, we went electronic. So since we went electronic, the certifying person and the submitter is the same person. Right. So there's no longer this possibility of having technical information submitted by one party and then having everything certified, usually by hard copy signature on another form. So that's why it's very important that certifying person must be able to submit electronically. And the last step that we recommend is to consider adding an authorized rep. Uh, authorized rep must be able to submit electronically at the e-permitting website. Um, and authorized rep cannot submit all documents, uh, NPDES documents like a certifying person, but it's good to have um, an authorized rep designated. Um, this is um, the list of forms that a certifying person um, can submit. And I highlighted the ones that an authorized rep can. So uh, notice of start, notice of cessation, submission of DMRs, and um, there we go. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you for your uh, attention. And uh, I'll take questions now. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Robert, for the presentation. We really appreciate your time. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of time left for questions here. However, if you do have any questions, you can uh, feel free to talk story with Robert afterwards, or you can uh, send him an email. I'm sure he'll be able to respond to you. That uh, goes with everyone on Zoom as well. Uh, so thank you again, Robert. This concludes the session. Um, the next session will be at 10.15. Uh, there's some refreshments out in the courtyard for you guys. Um, 
So make sure you check those out and definitely check out our vendor booths in room 306. Or if you're online, you can check out the uh, expo tab on the Zoom events. Um, thank you all for attending and uh, let's give Robert one more round of applause. Thank you guys.